Welcome back, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us here for another episode, wherever in the world you're listening to us from, whatever platform you're listening to us on. As always, thank you so much for the support. Thank you for checking this episode out. And also, thank you for sharing this podcast to others. It's been really exciting to see the community grow and see you guys discuss and share the episodes with fellow coaches who you know would be interested. And I definitely think a lot of coaches will be interested in this topic. It's one that if you've been in the game for any length of time, kind of go through this process. Today, we're going to be talking about getting out of your coaching comfort zone. I know that we all as coaches have our things that we like to stick to, our offensive or defensive principles and things that we really like to hold to. But we also know, especially at the high school level, that your players change and you got to adjust. And sometimes you got to do things that may be outside of what you're necessarily comfortable with. So what we're going to do today is discuss with our guest his process as he starts to go through that journey and talk about his goals for the upcoming season, getting out of his comfort zone, what he did in the past, what he's looking to implement this year, and kind of get a little peek into uh, the philosophy and a little bit of X's and O's behind that. So if you're in that position, uh, this is great for you. And if you're not in that position, I bet you're going to be there at some point. So my guest today to uh, discuss this topic is the Willard Varsity Boys Basketball Coach. I'm very happy to be joined by Coach Jeremy Dressler. Coach, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Yeah, yeah thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Same. Likewise. Coach, let's go ahead and get started with the basketball journey that you took. Where did the game of basketball take you? Where did your coaching journey take you? And what led you to Willard? Sure. So, you know, like uh, like, like most coaches, uh, basketball's pretty much been uh, my whole life. Um, you know, I was fortunate to play for a, a really good high school coach in Brian McTagg, who coaches at uh, Glendale High School in Springfield, Missouri right now. Um, we, we, I'm graduated from Clever, and he coached me all through uh, high school. Um, we were fortunate enough to play in uh, two Final Fours and um, had a really great high school experience. Um, after that, I took a scholarship to go play up at uh, William Jewell in Kansas City and um, just didn't work out for me, and that's okay. When one door closes, another one opens. And um, my sophomore year in college, uh, Clever uh, called me back and said, "Hey, we got a we got a junior high coaching job for you. Would you be interested in it?" And so I was uh, in the, d- taking accounting classes at the time, and I went home and coached one year, and then fell in love with it, and switched my major my junior year in college to <laughs> PE, which set me back a little bit because we all know uh, accounting classes and PE classes don't mess very well on the uh, graduation plan, but um, it allowed me to coach at Clever for five years, being the uh, the seventh grade coach and the freshman coach for four years. Um, and after that, once I graduated, I was able to um, land a varsity job right out of college. Um, went to a small town in Purdy, Missouri, which is about, about an hour uh, south of, uh, or really about between Springfield and Joplin, um, about an hour away. And um, that was a great first year. We uh, one went 24 and eight and uh, made it to the Final Four um, as the first Final Four in any boys' sport in that school history. So it was a lot of fun, um, and that allowed me to uh, – a coaching vacancy opened up in Willard late, and uh, I applied and was fortunate enough to get it. And this is now my fourth year at Willard High School, and I'm really excited to still be there. Excellent. And one of the – a couple of the stops that you made in your coaching journey are ones that that I made, and I know that they were very impactful for me, and I wanted uh, you to touch on those really quickly. I know that we have a lot of young coaches in particular that, that get into the profession, and maybe they're gunning for a varsity job, or some of them end up landing that varsity job, but, but like – you, I coach seventh grade. I also coach freshmen. And I wanted to ask you really quickly, what did those coaching experiences, coaching at the middle school level, coaching freshmen, what did that teach you that has kind of helped you with the uh, varsity position? Sure. Well, I think as, you know, when you first get into coaching, you know, you have this idea that you really know everything about the game already. <laughs> and um, when you get there that first day and now you're on the other side of the court, you know, we're actually coaching instead of playing you see things completely differently. And, and that kind of opens up a whole new world where you're seeing the whole game as a whole. And it just it, it makes you hungry to keep learning and keep, you know, the more coaches you talk to, they do different strategies and things because, you know, if you play for only one coach in high school like I did, you really only know one thing. And so I think that's been the journey as a young coach is the more relationships I build and they, you know, will let me come to their practices or I'll, I'll call them on the phone and pick their brain. Like you're just, your knowledge expands. Um, and I, I think when you're an assistant, you can't go talk to other coaches enough. And I've never met a head coach that won't take the time to talk to an assistant if they're hungry to learn. Yeah, 
that that's a hundred percent true. There's so many coaches out there that are willing to share their knowledge and, and love talking hoops and, and love to pass, pass the game on and pass what they know for sure. And, and to add on to that, I always thought that, you know, if you, if you can understand the game of basketball and you think you know it well, uh, you'll, you'll know if you try to coach the seventh graders, if you can explain right, it to right. it oh, in yeah. a way that they can understand, yes. <laughs> you're probably yeah, you on the right track. You cannot take anything for granted on what you think they might know. You've got to teach every detail, every aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, coach, before we get into our topic, I, I, I like to, uh, set the stage, especially for those coaches who maybe coach in areas that a lot of our listeners are, aren't familiar with. And I assume many of our listeners probably aren't familiar with uh, Willard, Missouri. So can you set the stage of, of Willard, Missouri, uh, paint a picture of the town, maybe the importance of sports and just what that environment is in general and maybe what um, maybe high school athletics might mean to the, to the town or the community? Sure. Um, so, so Willard is a very uh, interesting school district. Um, it's at, it's a town about five or six miles outside of Springfield, Missouri. But our uh, school district is actually the whole west side of Springfield. So mm. Willard only has a, a population of about 5,500 people, but our school district has 1,400. So uh, like we a are a city. large, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just the high school is 1,400. So we're, we're in the large, um, the, you know, the largest classification in Missouri um, with a town that's really pretty small in, in, in relevance and everything like that. So um, it is it is tough because some of the further parts of our district is, you know, 25 to 30 minutes away from our high school. So, you know, we have to take into account that, you know, there's going to be that travel time for kids and for families. And, you know, if we have a late practice because we don't have facility of space, you know, those kids might have to come home and come back. And if they've already made that trip once, well, now they're driving, you know, two hours round trip, you know, twice. So um, it is challenging at times, but it's a great place. Um, really rich uh, sports background. Um, currently, we're seeing a lot of success. Um, last year, we had a state champion uh, volleyball team and a state champion baseball team. Mm. Um, you know, and in the past, um, we you know we've had a lot of basketball districts. Our girls basketball team was ranked number one in the state for the majority of the year. Um, so there's been a lot of really good teams. The conference we compete in, um, football wise, is the, is the hands down the best conference in the state. A few years back, we had a uh, a team at our conference that played in the class six state championship, class five state championship and class four state championship. So, um, and all the other sports are right there with it. So it's a really uh, competitive conference and uh, it's just a, it's a fun district, but it's a unique district. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting situation, I imagine, with, uh, I think a lot of people think of, like, relatively big high schools, they think that everybody, you know, must live, like, really close by, and it's just, like, a quick trip away, but you have a high school, and it's like, you're, you're pulling them in <laughs> from, from pretty far reaches, in some cases, for them to get there, so... Uh, just unique, unique circumstances, but I, I can definitely get the sense from from your explanation that there's kind of a built-in culture that exists there in terms of the expectations for student athletes if they they walk in the door. Am I right in thinking that? Yes, I think I think the best asset that we have at Willard is um, there's no jealousy amongst coaches. Every single head coach wants the other program, and they may even be sharing or competing for athletes. They want them to succeed. Um, and when you get to larger schools, that is a rarity because it's so competitive and it's so cutthroat. So to be to be to work in a large school and have, you know, for example, the wrestling coach, we're competing for guys sharing, you know, the same winter sport time. You know, I want him to succeed and he wants me to succeed. And that that's a really special place to be. And that's a really interesting, unique point, because I've, I've heard of situations where you know, a football team, like a boys football team gets really, really successful. And then all of a sudden the boys basketball coach, is like frustrated them because they're going deep in the playoffs and they can't have right, their players right, for their yeah. practices or whatever. So I'm, I'm glad. And I think that the the players, I think in particular, they know and they, they can pick up on that sense that the coaches get along and the coaches are all in it together and work together and just strengthens your athletic program as far as I'm concerned. And I think the results speak for themselves for you guys, for sure. Yeah, Absolutely. All righty, Coach, so let's, let's kind of jump into this uh, getting out of your comfort zone. So let's kind of start with uh, the past here, the history. What led to you, or, or maybe it was you and your staff, what realization did you come to that made you realize, you know what, we, we got to make some changes here and, and we got to push past maybe what, what we've been doing and, and maybe go to a little a bit of a different direction? Sure. So um, kind of backtracking a little bit of, you know, history. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, what most coaches run what they have been taught in the past. So, you know, I'm running stuff very similar to what the coach I played for. Obviously, we, we had a pretty successful um, 
time when I was playing for him. Um, Drury University is here in Springfield. Uh, my head coach played for, for that head coach, or was under him as an assistant, excuse me. Uh, you know, they won a national championship not too long ago. Um, then you take the state run at Purdy, um, you know, and you put all that together, you know, you experience all that success doing one thing. You get really bought in, like, hey, this is a great way. It keeps replicating success. Um, and, and it did for us early. In my first two years, we came in, um, you know, we finished second in conference and had a, had a great year. That, that second year as that Willard, um, we got ranked in the top 10 in the state, you know, running the same same principles. Um, and then we got in kind of a, a bout with, with injuries and, and then COVID happened and everything like that. And um, we got to a situation where we kind of just kind of got stagnant, you know, and, and where we're at right now is we've got, which is a good problem to have, but also a, a difficult one is we've got a, about 10 or 12 guys um, that are all very similar um that at any given day can out be playing out one of the other guys and it's just hard to know who's going to be the guy to choose right there um and so instead of trying to sit there and be like who's our top six or seven in that rotation we're going to try to go deeper um you know but the way we have played in the past has been a a pack line you know half court you know dominating the ball you know really pressure make teams shoot it it's you don't have to play that many guys when you're playing like that you know you're not even though we're playing fast in transition there's a lot of times where we're making teams run offense for 30, 40 seconds, um, you know, and so we're at that point now where we kind of need to speed it up a little bit and to get everybody to have an opportunity to succeed. I felt like we had to play faster and, and by doing that, by pressing and, and trapping a lot more than we have in the past. Um, you know, one of the, the best attributes I think these kids have is, is we trap all ball screens. Um, okay. And so, so we, you know, I was like, we trap all ball screens and then when we give up the baseline we trap that spot too in the short corner so if those are our two best strengths on defense why not try to make those our strengths everywhere on the floor um and I know that seems like a really simple uh concept but that's what that's kind of what started it and now we're just kind of tinkering with it were, were there any things that in in particular that maybe you noticed uh on film or 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 even in games when you were coaching, did you have any, like, I, I, we call them like aha moments where you're like, wait a minute, like, Ooh, this, this isn't quite maybe where we need to be. Was there any, any moments that you had in particular that, that sort of like set off the light bulb that maybe we got, we had to change the course a little bit. Yeah. So, um, and just kind of the guys we have right now, um, you know, when you're playing that pack line, obviously you can't give up any straight line penetration to the rim or to the middle of the floor. Mm -hmm. And we kept having guys that were feeling a lot more comfortable being closer to their man. And so we kept saying, hey, get off your man. And they're wanting to, you know, get closer and really get out there and try to get those deflections, which we want. We want deflections, we want anticipation steals. And so it just kept me in that battle of if they're either squeezing hard, they're not getting any of those. Um, so we try to say, okay, we've got these group of kids. This is what they really want to be good at. This is what they enjoy doing. So I think the best coaches in high school have to adapt. And we yeah. can sit here and we can try to, you know, um, just – put it in them and ingrain them like you've got to get to that helpline, you've got to get to that gap, or we can try to adapt to what they're good at. And I think I think that's where we're at right now. It's just we've got 10 or 12 guys that like to play fast, that like to get in passing lanes, um, that have been really good at trapping when the times we do trap, and let's play to our strengths. Yeah, and it's it's kind of like the, the balance, as you kind of mentioned, of like what it is that you're in particular comfort with versus – you know, this is what my players do well, and this is what what best serves them. Versus, like, okay, this is this is what I know. I I can run this, and I can you know run this in my sleep, and teach this, and coach this in my sleep. But being able to know it as a coach, but then not necessarily having the players that are are gonna you know maximize that sort of system, I could imagine would would probably lead to some frustration. Was that something that you experienced where you knew the system really well, but it wasn't quite getting the results that you knew it could because the players just weren't uh, in the right position for it? Yeah, and I think that happened in year two. You know, when we got we were ranked ranked top ten at state at one point, and then we yeah. had a a two-time All-State player go down. And so now we're playing a lot of sophomores, which are really talented. They're seniors now. Uh, they're still really talented, long, athletic. Um, but it's just not something that they had grown up playing, you know, that style. Um, and so we just had to to find a way to continue to adapt to what they're doing and what they're successful at. And, and if you don't mind me asking, for, for those players that, that, that you did, um, that you just mentioned, w was the style of basketball that they were used to, is that more similar to what you're, what you're running right now? Yes, yeah. 
Um, and, and maybe not what they did exactly, but mm-hmm. it's just what they naturally, when they developed and gotten longer and faster and, and, and what their personalities are and personalities are a big thing. And, you know, what we saw this summer when we started putting this in is that they became, they, they bought into it and had ownership of it. And if you can get kids to believe in whatever they're doing, then that's gonna That's what's going to make you good. You know, if they're sitting there, they're not fully bought into doing this or they don't understand why they've got to get away from their man and get into that gap and that's a constant daily battle, then you've got to establish what your non-negotiables are, but you also got to allow them to have the ability to buy in and be, you know, own what they're doing. Because at the end of the day, it's them. It's their time. It's their show. And they've got to make the plays, both ends of the floor. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you there. And and was that buy-in conversation? Did you find that that was a difficult conversation? I feel like if that was something that that plays to their strengths, maybe it made it an easier conversation for you to have. Like, hey, we're going to change this up and this is because this is what you're strong at. How, how did the conversation, I guess, go with uh, getting them bought in and excited for what, what the new system you were putting in was? Yeah, I think it was just kind of a process. You know, it kind of started off slow mm-hmm. where we just would add kind of like trickle it in here and there for something different and kind of mix it up. And then we saw success. And obviously, you know, anybody with common sense, if you're seeing a little bit of success, you want to keep doing that to continue to replicate success. Um, and so is that. And then we've got, you know, a, a kid that's a really competitive senior that leads the team really well. And, you know, he, he got to a point where he was calling out when to trap and when not to trap. And gosh, when you got guys on the <laughs> floor that are coaching, I mean, that just makes possibilities, you know, your overall success pretty high. So, and, and it saves your voice a little bit too. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so let's kind of transition into the, some of the growing pains or growing experiences that you've had with adapting your coaching style. And I know that this is kind of in the, uh, relatively beginning phases as, as we kind of talk about the, the transition you're, you're undergoing. Were there any points where, as you were making that transition that you felt, um, uncomfortable or unsure or a bit uneasy? And if so, how did you sort of stay the course and, and, and keep, keep going through it? Yeah, I, I think I'm going through that right now a little bit when I sit there and design practices every day, you know, for this is now my 10th year coaching overall between being an assistant or a seventh grade coach, freshman, whatever, to varsity coach. You know, I've always kind of ran things in the first three weeks of practice pretty, pretty similar. You know, they were going to do, Hey, we're going to work on this, this day, which transitions to this, the next day. And, we just kind of go down the line, but if we did that, then by the time our first game, we wouldn't we wouldn't be doing anything with the the getting up and transitioning, the pressing and trapping, and you know we'd be back doing what we've always done. And so designing practice plans where we've got to if you're going to add something in, so we can work on trapping more, you've got to take something away. You can't have too much. There's only so much time you can practice, mm. you know. And I think that's where I'm at right now is what are we going to take out since we're going to be adding different elements into our game. And I know I've been through uh, that same process where if I want to implement something new or do something new, because I don't have maybe necessarily the same amount of confidence I have with something else, I almost don't know how long something is going to take. If I'm trying to put something new, I don't know if I'm articulating it the right way. There's that little bit of doubt that I know I always have. And I try to, you know, bury that as much as I can. But was that something you also had to kind of go through? How much learning of... I know you know obviously how to how to press and trap and everything like that, but how much learning did you feel you had to go through in order to kind of go through the process of knowing how to actually teach it as effectively as possible? What sort of learning had to happen on your end? Yeah, I you know we've kind of you know we have not really pressed or trapped that much in the past to be honest with you outside of ball screens, which we've always done. Um, you know we've kind of just had presses there for you know in, in certain situations in a game or you know into half. Um, and so we've never really taken the time to, you know, break it down a whole part whole or however you want to do it. And so now, you know, like today, like I'm sitting here creating, okay, how do we take this action in our press and get really dang good at it? So we need to break that into where we can rep it to where not only certain guys know that spot, but everybody on the team can be subbed in and run that spot. And and that's kind of where we're at right now is we're kind of in the innovative stage of, breaking what we're wanting done down into smaller segments so we can really rep it and go over details and be really efficient at it. Um, which is fun because it's new for me and it's creative. I like it. I'm, I'm motivated for it. Um, but again, you go to the part about what am I going to take out that I really believe in? Um, so it's just that learning curve. Um, but the players are doing really well and, and, and they believe in it. And, um, I, it's a fun journey and I, and, um, 
right now we got some really competitive players, which makes it a lot easier to coach. Yeah, a- absolutely. I think that if you have those competitive players, they're going to be ones ready to take the challenge. They're ready to jump on it. And it's like, all right, this is a lot more fun now that, you know, that buy-in and that competition is there. Uh, you mentioned about, you know, having to take some stuff out. Um, what What's that process been like? I know you said you used to really like the, the pack line, used to do that. Yeah. So I assume some of those principles had to kind of go away or just completely gone altogether. But are there other things you had to kind of shorten or shelve completely to make sure that you got this, uh, the press and the trapping down the way you wanted it? Yeah. So I think, you know, from going back to tryouts, the main thing we had to do is we have to be able to play, we have to be able to practice in the full court more. You know, most of my practices in the mm. past have been where we've kept more kids. You know, we might have 22, 23 kids in just a varsity JV practice and our freshmen would come in and practice second. You know, that's a lot of kids. Um, and so we'd be able to go, you know, five on five on each half and really rep and really win in the half court. Um, and so we, we cut down. We cut down to the lowest numbers we ever had. We were only at 16 for between varsity and JV. Um, they're all really good kids, all high character kids, and um, all good kids are going to buy in, which I think is important. And um, we've been able to transition more into that full court realm of, of getting up and down, which means we don't have to condition as much on, at the end because they're running during practice and kids love that. And um, so I think that is, this has been the big part of it, which then kind of going back to what you were asking is uh, shortening. We can get through stuff a lot quicker because there's so much less kids. Um, and so something that normally we'd have to spend, you know, eight to 12 or 15 minutes on, we can get it done in five or under. Um, and so practices that became more efficient, um, which is really nice and makes coaches feel good because you feel like you're flying through stuff because you can actually get a lot more accomplished because you're not having to rep everybody through each drill. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I'm a hundred percent with you on there. I feel like if we're, we're, you can almost like feel it. It's like a synergy, I guess, in the gym or some energy level in the gym where it's like, we're just going right? And, and, and we're moving along at a great pace. We're moving, we're moving, we're moving. And I feel like there's almost like this uh, electricity that kind of exists in the gym where everybody's kind of locked in. And like, to me, I don't think there's a better feeling in a practice. Than yeah, that. No. I don't know about you. Well, I just know you get through, you know, hey, I think some coaches can rep shell all, all day long, you know? And um, when you have fewer guys and you're trying to, you know, get up and down more, you know, you're only spending so much time on these these drills. And so kids don't get in that lull. You know, they're like, okay, we're repping it really hard. We're being competitive. And now there's something new. And now they're excited about something new. And so we're repping it really competitive. And we're not hitting that mid, mid-practice mid drag um, or, you know, that last third of practice where you're just kind of going through the motions. We haven't had that yet, which has made things a lot of fun. Yeah. No, uh, absolutely. And, and that's – I think that's one of the things that I – kind of struggled with as a coach sometimes, and, and perhaps you can speak to this too, is when you have something in place, you have a system in place or something that players are pretty comfortable with, they can almost get away with like going through the motions and it still looks good, but there's maybe not a lot of thinking involved because yeah. they already know what they're supposed to do. So it might look nice to an outsider, but I don't know how much brain activity is actually taking place necessarily. No, I'm with you. Sometimes, you know, we call it, you know, you can't be a robot. You got to be a basketball player. Sometimes kids, you know, will do a certain drill so long or, or so often that they know the, the flow of it. And so they can cheat it a little bit and they're just, they're not adapting to not being basketball players making decisions in each situation. So um, that's what we've been able to avoid this year with all this uh, new drills and, and shorter, uh, shorter drills that they just don't get in that flow and they're actually having to use their brain and think and adapt and, and, and read defenses. And read offenses and and with the the new the new things that you've you've put in you talked about more like going full court a little bit more up and down and everything um have practices then become messier in terms of you know mistakes being made or you know maybe people out of position or not not quite doing what they want have they become like a little less clean and a little little messier since making this uh, transition um, at times, yeah. Um, I think I think it's early season, so everything's a little sloppy. Um, but yeah, right. But uh, no, you know, kids kids want to play, and and now that there's so much opportunities for kids to go play travel ball and summer ball, and you know they're playing year round. You know, kids love to get in the full court, and so mm-hmm. um, when it starts getting a little sloppy, you know, we'll just stop it and say, hey, this is what we're really trying to hit on right here. Um, you know, and I've got some guys that can can really score the ball this year. And, you know, one thing we say, like, hey, I know you can do that every time right now in the full court, but we're trying to rep this. So I need you to get, you know, out of your comfort zone a little bit 
and, and try to make this action happen. Because if you can figure that out and still do what you're really good at, that makes us that much better. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and I, I think that's a good point about the way that basketball is played, especially if you have like travel players or club players, you know, they're, they're getting up and down the court a lot. And so it kind of transitions pretty well. If, you know, if it just so happens now with what you're doing, it's, a lot more transferable. I think that's the right word for it. Yeah, so it's a yeah. lot of, a lot of basketball that they're used to for sure. So um, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but, and I know it's still, still early season at the time that we're recording this, but what successes I have you seen? And I know we've touched on this, but what are you really hoping that you're going to be seeing on the court this year by, by making these transitions and getting out of your comfort zone that, you wouldn't have gotten last year or you wouldn't have gotten this year had you been running the same thing? What are you kind of tangibly hoping for? And what have you also actually seen? Yeah, I think, I think the number one thing is when we're going to play like this, because we got a lot more guys that can compete at the varsity level is you get more guys that are wholeheartedly uh, bought in and accountable for what's happening at the varsity level. Um, you know, a lot of teams have have JV guy, you know, majority JV guys that are great bench players that you know cheer and talk and do all that. Um, but they, at the end of the day, they don't think they're getting in, you know, and so they're only there and you know the end of game minutes if they're either up or down by a lot. Um, playing like this, every everybody's tangibly invested, and so even in practices, if certain guys go to the like more of the JV in for different stuff, they know they're going to get the opportunity to come back as long as they can beat down there. So it's really it's made our, our our JV level a lot more competitive because guys want the opportunity to come back and, and get an opportunity at the varsity level, um, which I think that's going to help um, our overall um, team chemistry, and which which may be a challenge because everybody's going to have to sacrifice just a little bit of playing time for the overall team success. But I think it's going to have more kids wholeheartedly invested. Well, and, and that's an interesting, like, little little benefit of, of, the, of the transition and the change that you're going through. I, I feel like now that almost changes the way that you either, either look at your bench or maybe design your bench or even think about substitutions and the way you kind of are going to approach your, your in-game coaching philosophy now. I feel like your bench is going to, as you just sort of mentioned, kind of take on a whole new meaning for you and, and, and will potentially add like a whole new wrinkle for you to now have to kind of consider and kind of tinker with as the season goes on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, um, guys that are on the bench, you know, they, they've got to know the overall details, but they don't, it's not like do or die for them. You know, now we're going to have, you know, eight, 10, 12 guys, maybe at times that are having to know details and are having to be bought in or having to communicate on the bench. And, and, and that's going to be like, you never know when your number is going to get called. We say that all the time to kids, but that's going to have an, a legitimate meeting this year. You don't know when you're going in and you've got to be ready to go in. And I, I feel like, and I'll, let, and, and I'll let you speak to this, of course, I feel like that may also have, have helped your practices a little bit because I feel like now the players, especially as the season goes on and they really see it, are going to actually tell like, yeah, like I better be practicing as hard as I can because I know this year, like I'm needed. Now. I'm not just an option. Like I'm a necessity uh, during a game. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's, that's been the biggest thing. And that, that's probably stopped a lot of that you know, uh, mid-practice lull is because guys are really fighting and guys are wanting to pass each other. Um, and, and we preach all the time, you know, hey, you've got to you've got to compete on the court. And when you're off the court, you got you got to be boys. And, and that's that's part of it. And they've done a really good job of leaving everything on the court. And, you know, when they're matched up with their best friend, they're not taking it easy on them. There's no brother in law and and they're getting after it. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's just going to make the whole program a lot more competitive. Um, and gosh, hey, in high school sports, just competing is 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 a major part of the battle. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I like your point a lot about you know we're we're all we're all in this together. And I, I think a lot of teams definitely want like that culture. They definitely want the the buy in and every player you know giving it their all. But I think it's just that much easier for players to do that when they know like, hey, I'm actually going to be playing here yes. too. I'm not just sitting no, on the bench no the doubt. whole time. No yeah. doubt. Um, the question that just popped in my mind, and I, and I know that some coaches listening are, are going through the process or considering the process of getting out of their comfort zone. And, and there's certainly a danger in thinking, oh, if I go out of my comfort zone, I'm, I'm blowing everything up. Everything I know as a coach is getting thrown out the window. And, and I don't think that's the case, and nor do I think that's the case with you. So I did want to ask, 
even though you are changing up your defense, you are going a little bit um, outside of that comfort zone. What are still some things that are like non-negotiables? What are some things that you're definitely still keeping um, from previous years coaching that are going to be a part of this year's group? Yeah, I mean, we're not we're not throwing away the whole system. You know, we're we're still going to be trying to run pack line and and do that stuff when the opportunity's there. Um, you know, basketball is not a perfect game. You know, it's a fluid game, and when the situation's there where we've got to really buckle down and get a stop on the half court, we're going to be ready for that. Um, but when we can play to our strengths and our speed and our length and our athleticism and our ability to make shots from every spot on the floor, you know, we're going to play like that. And so it's just one of those things where um, we're going to be ready for everything, but we're not going to just throw everything out. Um, we're just going to kind of value something else a little bit more at this point in time. Um, but you still have to have your, your, your core principles and, and what you believe in and, 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 you know, that pack line defense, and we're not going to give up layups. We can live with threes. That's our philosophy on defense um, is, is what we're, we're still going to do. It's just going to be spread out a little bit more, which means guys got to fly around quicker and make plays faster and, and, uh, and just compete a little bit more. And, and I mean, that, that's a good point. I think with the transition that you're making and, and the adjustments you're making, you know, if you're, you're a big pack line person, and now, now you're making more of a transition, like you said, into into pressing. Um, pack line will still serve its place for for when you need to be in in the half court, right? You still can buckle down in the half court and still and still run that for sure. And so, I'm curious then, it, it, since you are still going to be uh, having some pack line, you're still going to be ready to go in the half court because you have been making this transition into into pressing more. Has that kind of changed or made you think about what points of emphasis are the most important for you in the pack line because you can't necessarily maybe spend as much time on it as you normally would? Yeah, so where we're kind of at right now, the process of it is we're just extending that pack line, you know, and that's kind of how we're teaching our traps and our pressing right now. Um, it's still all the same principles. So if we're going to spread out and say we're doing a half-court trap, you know, those gaps are just a little bit bigger, you know, and, and that ball can't get through there. And if we're going, if we're double teaming the ball, then you still got to get right here on the helpline and you got to protect the basket and you've got to get here ready to run through a passing lane. And those are all the same exact things we teach. It's just stretched. Um, and I think that's been an easier transition for our players to, to grasp that um, because it's, we're still using the same terminology. Um, even though the points of emphasis and we're playing at different spots on the floor, the terminology and, and the concept is still the same, if that makes sense. Yeah, and and it's something that it's probably a lot easier for your players to who are who are in your previous system to pick up on because they're you're, they're not necessarily expected to learn whole new technology or technology terminology or, or principles. Like you said, it's more here's what we already do. Now what happens, right? If we just extend it. Yeah. out into this full court situation. And so there's already a lot of baseline knowledge that they have, which has probably helped uh, that, that transition for them, I'm assuming. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's a good, maybe that that's a good point for, for coaches who are kind of looking to get out of their comfort zone. It, it might just be as simple as, you know, instead of blowing everything up, maybe take some things that you like and take some things that, that already work and maybe just, like, like you said, stretch them out into, you know, the full court or maybe make little changes to it rather than maybe having an incoming senior have to learn something completely different their senior year than they did the previous three years. Yeah. You know, I, and I think it's, I think it's more just a discovery process, you know, or a discovery journey. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you, if you just blow everything up and you're, you know, you teach a whole new system and what if you get halfway through that year and now you're unhappy with that system? Do you do you go back and reteach your old system and start from scratch in the middle of the season? And I think that'd be very challenging, you know. And so I think this gives us the you know the the fluidity to be able to fluctuate um, to what we've always done in the past to what we're doing right now, you know, situationally. Um, and I think we will, we will be able to fall back into that comfort zone of what we're really good at and what our non-negotiables are. Um, but still have the freedom to be in this discovery mode. And, and maybe, maybe that discovery process allows us to find new things and, and continue to add new things and get better at certain things. And um, it's just kind of, we're just kind of on a, in a, in a journey right now. <laughs> well, well and, and, and what you're, what you're doing isn't 
sacrificing necessarily your your principles and beliefs as a coach. You're 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 still having the same principles that you believe in and the same uh, philosophies and a lot of the same tenets of, of what you like to do, but maybe just pushing it into a different area or to a different space, but you're still keeping things that you personally believe in as a coach. And I, and I think that that might be helping your transition as well. Yeah. And I think that just goes like, as a coach for me, I still have to have confidence in what we're doing, you know, and, and, and kids aren't dumb. They, they know <laughs> when, when a coach is genuine, they know when a coach is, is confident and they know when a coach can, believes in what they're doing, you know? And so I think we're going out here um, where they feel like I'm confident and where we're headed with stretching this out and, and getting out of our comfort zone and playing more in the pool and the, the half court trap and stuff. But they also know that we have that in our back pocket that we've been successful with in the past and we can't continue to be successful, but I do feel like it's good at this group by stretching it out will take us to another level that we couldn't hit if we stayed really tight. Yeah, for sure. And, and going back to a previous point that we talked about, uh, obviously with what you're running is going to require a little bit more or a lot more use of, of your bench and they got to be a lot more ready and a lot more prepared to go. Is there any work that you and your staff needed to do to maybe get your, your benches skill set up to where they needed to be? Was there any extra work that needed to be done uh, or uh, was, was that not necessarily the case? I know, I know for me, one of the situations I came in was I realized um, in one of the years I was coaching that maybe my first six or so were, were ready to go. But then if I wanted to stretch something out to uh, a lot of pressing, I realized that my players at the end of the bench, their offensive skill set or other skill sets probably weren't up to par for them to be playing the minutes I required. So I was curious if you maybe had any additional work you found that you needed to do with, with some of your bench players to get them up to speed with everything. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, this is kind of where it all the, you know, the ideology of all this of changing a little bit started is that, um, you know, last year our, our more of our bench guys weren't ready. They weren't ready physically. Um, they weren't strong enough. Um, you know, but they made so much, uh, transition into the summer where they really caught up with a lot of the current varsity guys. Um, and so we have guys, you know, we've got kind of four guys that are, you know, clear to find like, Hey, those are our dudes. Um, but then we have a, like, you know, eight guys that are all kind of, Hey, one day he's out playing him one day he's playing him and he's a little bit better shooter. He's a little bit better defender, but they all deserve that opportunity. Um, and so it's like, we can't just go game by game. Like, okay. Uh, guy number nine, you're going to play this game, but guy six, you're, this doesn't fit you. You're going to be JV only. Like that's going to be really hard to keep buy-in on the team because guys will be and, – and keep parents happy too, and that's another whole dynamic, you know. And so um, we just said, so how do we get all of these guys to be successful? And so what we found ourselves doing this summer is, you know, we'd we be platoon swapping even at times where we go five in, five out. And I really like that. I don't know if we'll do that this year at the varsity level uh, to that extreme. But I found like we built a lot of confidence in our kids that, hey, we can platoon swap and be just fine because maybe we're missing, you know, maybe a little bit stronger or more athletic guy that's coming off the bench, but we're gaining a better shooter. And we just kind of adjust our offense to what their strengths are. And um, so if we're all playing this defense and playing fast and scrambling, then everybody's getting a chance to eat. And uh, we're, we're not in a system of, of trying to keep everybody happy, but I think this is a way to keep everybody happy and us also achieve the most success possible. Well, one of the things too that, that, I, that I liked, and I, I think you're going to find out, and you have probably, I'm sure, found out, is when you do the uh, platoon subs, like you mentioned, this work that you did in the summer, that is a great indicator for those players, especially the ones on the bench, to really kind of get a sense of where it is that they're at and, and where they are on the court and what they need to work on. Because I know as a coach, I always kind of struggled sometimes with telling, you know, our bench players, here's what you got to work on, here's what you have to do. And maybe they do work on it, but then I haven't seen them do it in a game, but then I also right. don't put them in a game. Right, so, right. you know, you kind of have that balance. But with what, what you're doing now by having them in the summer, it's like, hey, you're, you're in here and, and the, it's going to speak for itself. Here's what you're doing. Maybe here's what you need to work on. And I feel like maybe that's also something that, that you found. I'll, I'll let you speak on that if you made that discovery as well. Yeah, we, we made that discovery last year uh, a little bit, unfortunately, because of hard way. <laughs> yeah, because of COVID and, and all those protocols and quarantines. And, you know, we got to a stretch last year where we only had two of our top original six healthy. 
you know, and, and so we weren't That's playing. Very deep. Call. <laughs> yeah. So we were only playing, you know, seven, you know, seven guys really originally. And so now we're just down to, you know, two of those guys. And um, so we started having to rely on other guys. And then we, we had to put them in those varsity games and see how they, you know, reacted. And, and a lot of guys really stepped up and took uh, advantage of the opportunity. You know, you always hear coaches say that cliche, like you just got to be ready for that opportunity and you need to take advantage of it. And we had guys that did that. And then, so when you add the other pieces back into the summer, you're like, well, that guy deserves it too. Like we can't just push him back because he produced at this level as well. And, and that's, that's kind of the real start was, was <laughs> really unfortunately with COVID is just that we've got to find ways to get everybody being able to produce because we have a lot of guys that can produce. Well, I, I think going to that point, I think a lot of coaches and I think almost every coach either had to reflect on their program or, or maybe really get to that point of, of making changes to their program because of COVID. Like you said, it wasn't the, the situation any of us wanted, but I think it was a really good almost like wake up call for, for some people of like, you know, this is where our program's at and, and having to go from there. And, and it's kind of, like you said, it's not necessarily the um, maybe the, the event you wanted to have happen, but it's almost like making the best out of a bad situation, which it sounds like is, is kind of happening with you now as you kind of start to transition out of that comfort zone. Yeah. I mean, you just, you, you got to play the hand you're given, you know, you play the hand you're dealt and, um, you know, I think a little side story last year, we had a, a senior who was a, an awesome kid, um, but wasn't touching the floor at all the first half of the season. And then we got down that stretch where we had a lot of guys quarantined. Um, you know, he got that opportunity to play, you know, and I think he was always pretty nervous to like, you know, make one mistake or do this. He was trying to play per perfection, but when there was no one else to replace him, he just <laughs> got to go play. And he built that confidence within himself. And by the end of the season, when we did get healthy, we, st we didn't take him off the floor. He became a guy that had to be on the floor all the time. Um, and I think it's just, it's, it's, it's interesting because he probably wouldn't have had that opportunity in a non-COVID year. Uh, that's, that's funny. I can imagine a situation where you only have a, f a few players and they make a mistake and they're looking at the bench and you're just looking at them like, well, it's, it's you. You're yeah. what I got out here. So You're, you're my guy. <laughs> so it's, it's all good. Let's just keep going through it. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's. Uh, it's funny in its own way. It's it's unfortunate yes. it gets to that point, but it's right. it's a good it's a good learning experience, and I guess it makes subbing a lot easier if you don't have any choices. Like, well, I guess I don't have to think about this too much. My subs, um, yeah. So again, a lot of coaches either at the end of the year or you know I, I know I've been in the middle of the year. Where I'm like, oh man, I I might have to make some changes. What advice would you give to coaches who might be thinking about going on this journey that you are uh, in regards to making changes to their coaching style? Is there anything that you might give them advice that might, might push them over the edge and, and, and maybe be, be ready to just go for it? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing is you just have to stay true to yourself um, and you you have to establish what your non-negotiables are. Like what, what can you not sacrifice? Um, and then once you can establish what you can't sacrifice, then you get to see what, okay, hey, it's okay if I get rid of that a little bit. You know, it's okay to shed this off here and there. Um, and, then, and then be able to add new. And and it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes and try things. You know, as coaches, especially with the increase of technology and everything, we, you know, we have all this pressure to to win and, and it's cutthroat. But, you know, it's still just life. And it's still profession. It's still fun. We're still working with kids. Um, and it's okay to try something and it not work out. Um, as long as we're always continuing to adapt and learn and grow and not be complacent, then I don't think you can ever fail as a coach. Yeah, and I, I think there's a certain level of excitement maybe of like kind of changing things up a little bit or sort of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and in, in breaking away from the routine, even personally as a coach to, you know, try and throw some stuff in. And I, I think that it's important for us in this profession to kind of be like lifelong learners and kind of lifelong adapters and, and being yeah. able to adjust and being able to put new stuff out there. You know, I think that if you're, maybe running the, the, the same system you've ran for, for 30 plus years that uh, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe it works or maybe it doesn't, but I, th I think change, change isn't necessarily a bad thing and, and kind of test you as a coach as well. And this year is going to provide some new learning opportunities for you that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just, you know, um, calling other coaches and picking their brain about situations and I'm not, a, I'm not someone that thinks I, that I know everything about this profession. So I'm always quick to pick up a, a phone call. And, you know, I've built some really good relationships just in the past, you know, half year going through this process, just 
you know, hey, what what is, what makes your program successful at this, and how can I implement it without giving up what my non negotiables are? Um, that, I think that that journey is really fun, and that goes right back to something that we talked about earlier about how coaches love to talk, and coaches yeah. will talk with you, and <laughs> yes. they'll sit you yes. down, yes, and, and talk hoops with you. Uh, great. Um, uh, something that just came to mind from the second question I asked about the uh, about Willard, and and you mentioned about the. Uh, legacy and, and the standards uh, of athletics at that program. I, I imagine that there is a, a high level of, of community involvement, a parent involvement, that the parents are very involved and very invested in what happens in the program. Did you have to have any conversations with, with, with parents or, or talk about or have to go through anything of like, hey, we're changing things up a little bit. Like, don't, don't worry about it. Where parents been fully supportive and on board. Your parents even really know that things are changing. What is, is, have those conversations taken place? And if so, I guess, how did they go? Yeah, um, we, ha we haven't had our parent meeting yet um, because our, our football team did win uh, a, a district game. So we're just, we're just in day three of having all of our guys back. So um, we just finalized our roster about a day ago, and um, but that will be a topic of conversation. Um, with keeping less kids, that means kids that – there will be a lot of kids that play both. Um, and so we have to be okay that um, juniors will be on JV, and I don't know why there's a certain stigma that's developing lately that it's, it's wrong for juniors to play JV, but juniors will be on JV, um, and juniors will be playing varsity, and they're going to get a little bit of both. And um, – we all have to understand that it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. So um, I think that'll be the conversation. Um, but yeah, we've got, we've got uh, parents that are really invested with their kids and um, community, community members that really support the program. And um, it's, it's a good place to work. Yeah, that, that, that always helps. That, that, that always helps when you're, when you're in that situation, when you have the support there, because it, it can get, and I'm sure, and you know this, it can get dicey sometimes when you have to, you know, make a, make a right turn, make a left turn here and there. And right. you don't necessarily know how, uh, how people are going to handle it or people are going to take it. So it's like a little bit of holding your breath, like, okay, hope this, hope everyone's good, but it sounds like everybody looks like they're going to be on board. And, um, like you said, with having less players, that also kind of helps a little bit too. in the, in, in maybe some of those, uh, playing time conversations. Yes. And yeah. And that, and that might have to deal yeah. with. Yeah, and that's and that's you know that's the root of most issues is just playing time, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, when you when you get a, a senior class like we've had who played varsity as sophomores, it doesn't provide a ton of opportunities for kids behind them to creep up and also play varsity early. And yeah. uh, you know, and we've got a we've got a since we are a small community with a large school, sometimes we still get caught up in that small community mindset. I think that would be the only downfall at times. Yeah. Um, and then, and we'll, and we'll, we'll definitely touch base and we'll, we'll see how things go throughout the season. But hopefully I said with, with less players in the system you're running, it's like, well, you're going to have to play because we need you. <laughs> yeah. There's no other yeah. option with what we're doing. Um, in terms of staff by and the, the staff that you, that you work with your coaching staff, has the adjustment been pretty good with them? Was it a conversation you had with them of, Hey, we're changing things up a little bit. Um, was, how was that transition of, of getting your staff ready for the, the changes that you were making? Well, pretty good. I got two brand new coaches with me. So, um, <laughs> my, uh, my JV coach, uh, really proud of him. He went out and got a, his first varsity job at a, a town called Wablo, Missouri and a uh, smaller school, but they've got some really good young kids and he's going to have a great year, I believe. And then, uh, my freshman coach has kind of been my, my right hand man for a long time. And he, he is, uh, he just stepped down. He's got some kids coming up and wants to be more, more at home. And so uh, we hired a new freshman coach as well. So um, when you got a new JV coach and a new freshman coach, uh, you kind of, they don't really have any prior expectations. So it's been, that part's been pretty smooth. Yeah, that helps a lot. Uh, no transition, you're new. So it's all, <laughs> don't worry about what we did before necessarily. Not, not all, yeah. not completely, but uh, this is what we're doing now. So uh, no worries. You don't have to forget a lot of stuff that we did in the past because you didn't know it anyway. Right. Agreed. Agreed. On offense, coach, is, is anything really changing on that end? And, and if so, what is it? And if not, why did you not feel the need to really make any changes on the offensive end? Yeah, we, we run a five out motion, um, which is which is the way we run it. Uh, we run that against everything. So we run it against man. We run it against any kind of zone. Um, we just try to really, we tweak a few things here and there between man and zone, but, um, you know, I believe in that offense. Um, I think it allows everybody on the floor to get an opportunity to touch the ball 
and have an opportunity to score. Obviously, certain guys need to get more touches than others. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I wholeheartedly believe in that. And I think it'd be a, uh, a I'd be very surprised if I ever change out of that. <laughs> um, uh, now, that being said, we'll run, you know, secondary and third different off, uh, offenses from time to time situationally. But, um, you know, even if we had a team full of bigs who, you know, can't run the, the five wide, there's ways to still be successful with the, the five wide spread, you know, motion offense and still have a bunch of bigs. So um, that's just something I really believe in. And there might be a day, there might be a day, but it's not today. <laughs> it's not today. Some things don't, just don't need to change. And I, and I think too, if, if you have something that you, that you believe in and that works and you know, you're already trying to change one thing, there is probably something to be said about limiting the amount of variables or limiting amount of yeah. all the things you're trying to change and at least keep some things constant so they can really get good on that as opposed to having to split their attention maybe on like, okay, this full court trap defense. And then, oh, now we have this new thing on offense and it might, might be spreading them a little thin, you know, how high schoolers can be sometimes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think I think what we run offensively, every offensive concept can be Im implemented or taken away into it. So even with our junior high teams, they don't get too caught up in, hey, running exactly what we're running. Like whatever you guys teach, we can incorporate within our motion and and uh, I just think it's the most adaptive offense when you're running a true motion. So mm -hmm. it's, it's been fun. For sure. Uh, and, and last part here about the actual uh, implementation as you start to go full court and more pressing. Have you had to do more work in terms of transition offense? Have you found that you're working more on transition opportunities out, out of the press and, and getting turnovers versus maybe just having run pack line. Uh, what's the situation been in, in regards to getting out in transition this year? What are you hoping for this year? Yeah, we um, transition offense has actually been probably one of our, our stronger suits. Um, and so we, we've really kept all that the same. Um, obviously, if we get to a point where, you know, we're not transitioning well or guys are kind of out of position on that, we don't run a a structured, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you know, primary break or secondary break. Um, you know, we kind of tell you, hey, we need to fill these spots at this point of the floor where you're either penetrating and kicking or, or you're moving the ball up the floor quickly. Um, our number one rule on offense is first open guy gets the ball no matter what. So mm. uh, when you when you kind of keep it pretty loose like that, um, we just want kids to be basketball players. You know, we want them to make plays. We want them to be able to learn the game and read the game and um, that way, when we get kids, and we've been fortunate to coach some pretty talented kids in our program, um, whatever college they end up going to, if they get that opportunity, they can just understand concepts and reading and, and spacing and, and be successful in whatever offense the, their coach wants to run. So um, that's kind of where we're at on our offenses. We, we feel like that is uh, just pretty pretty fluid and, and pretty um, – just not very structured. So – is that has uh, that always been your your philosophy on on getting out in transition? Just let's get the ball and, and make the most out of the opportunities versus, like you said, structured. You know, first action, second action type things. Yeah, um, you know, we, and we got we got some rules in it, like you know. But the first guys up the floor, like we're trying to we're trying to fill those corners. You know, we've got a big this year. We do have a big that we have uh, not done in the past. We're making him rim run every time. <laughs> um, you know, and and normally we've kind of been a five out spread. Uh, transition offense, but we're, we're making him rim run and get down to the short corner and block. And that's opened up a lot of opportunities for him um, just because we got guys that can really shoot it around him. Um, but yeah, we just, Hey, first guy, first guy down the floor, get here and, and we'll try to get you the ball quick and then we'll make a read out of it. You know, if the defense, you know, wants to stay in tight, then we'll just, you know, follow our pass and knock down a shot. If they want to stay out wide and we're just going to keep the ball and penetrate in and go score one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and um, we don't, we don't want to. We don't want guys to be robots at all. We want and, them to make plays and and find spacing. And it sounds like that that's kind of playing to to what your team's strengths are. Anyway, I think you 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 emphasized a few things that that your team was strong was strong at. And I think that you know if you have a team that that's athletic or long or, or or they're able to kind of like move the ball, then to let them kind of be more free flowing just really gives them more of an opportunity to to create things versus maybe limp, maybe in in a situation where you have a team like that having them have a lot of structure may limit the amount of like athleticism or the amount of explosiveness that they might right. normally have, right? Yeah, you want you want guys to be able to go make plays and not second guess things or trying to be perfect. And when you start pursuing perfection as a player, you're never going to be a good player. 
And I, and I think too, also to just kind of wrap up that thought, I think, I think if you're able to successfully have a situation where you just sort of, you have a couple of rules, like you mentioned, getting out in transition, but it's more loosely defined that eliminates the, the robotic nature of things. And especially yeah. even in a practice situation where you can actually really see your, your player's decision-making and what they think is like the best move or the best read to make in that situation versus trying to find spots necessarily and trying to go through particular motions. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I completely agree. Awesome. Coach, uh, to wrap up, there's a couple questions that, that I ask every guest. So I'll go ahead and get started here with this first one. Uh, thinking back on your coaching career, and I think you said it's been about 10 years, what is a coaching moment from, of yours that you think others listening would be able to learn from? Yeah, I think, I think the, the biggest moment from how I got to where I'm at right now going through this process is um, just experiencing uh, losing, you know, always being part of a successful program and then experiencing that first time where I had to learn learn how to lose. And I know that sounds silly to say, but um, it is challenging. It's, it's challenging because you start to second guess. Do I even know what I'm doing? Can I even do this job? And I think that just goes back to what I said earlier. You just got to stay true to yourself. Um, you know, I, I love going to coaching clinics, listening to guys talk and, you know, I'll hear college coaches, you know, say things that I know I'm saying in practice every day. And I think that just kind of reaffirms what we are doing as coaches. And, 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 uh, I just, I think staying true to yourself at all times, no matter what the situation is, is, is the most important. Yeah. And I, I think even just, just adding on to what you said, and you had, you had a great response there. I, I think coaching can sometimes be such an isolating profession that it is really nice to be able to go out to clinics or go out to some of these things and be able to hear certain things that you also believe in. That's kind of reassuring as well. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Like, oh yeah. I do this and you do this. Okay. I feel like a little bit yeah. better that I'm not in an Island. Right, here necessarily. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, coach to wrap up, I give every guest what I call uh, a 60 second soapbox uh, to your platform, get out uh, a final thought, a final idea, kind of a closing message that you want to leave the listeners with. Don't worry. I'm not going to time you feel free to go over 60 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor and I'm going to kind of let you take it from here. Yeah, I think, um, you know, something that I really encourage a lot of coaches to do is to, to find time to really go out and just have fun with your team away from basketball you know, take them bowling, take them, you know, to the movies or, or go watch a college game. You know, one thing that we're doing this year, so we got a lot of guys that want to go play in college is I've contacted all the local colleges and, and we're going to try to find time to either go watch a practice or go watch a game together. And so they can see that next level and, and, and then go out to eat, you know, and gosh, it's so much fun going out to eat after games and, and are on special events. And um, the winter, it gets so cold, obviously, we're from where we're from and, and sicknesses and everything. It can be a, a hard grind. But to find time just to go out there and have fun away from basketball is so important uh, to, I think, overall team success. 100% agree, but can't relate any more to those winters out here in Arizona. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I don't yes. know what that means, but <laughs> yeah. I no, I grew up in Chicago. I, I know exactly what you mean by that. Yeah, though, they can get some long days, even though the sun's out yes. for not a short period of time, long days. Now, you mentioned practice, uh, going to see a college practice. I'm going to put you on the spot really quick. Besides besides that, what, what has been like one of your favorite activities that you've done uh, with, with your team? I think you mentioned bowling too. What's one of your favorite activities that yeah. you've done away from basketball with, with your teams in the past? Um, well, this has kind of been the summer and something unique that we do. Um, we, we go on one really big varsity trip every summer. Um, so like this past summer, we went, we took the varsity team down to Florida state, uh, which is about a 14, 15 hour drive for us. Um, we went to that camp for, for three days and stayed in Tallahassee. And then we, we drove up to Destin um, and stayed in a, a beachfront condo right on the beach um, and those two days on the beach is if we don't make it to the final four, they're going to remember that trip over anything else we do. Um, and, and it's, it's going to be on the beach. It's not the Florida state part. It's the beach part, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and I think that's just, uh, really fun and, and, and special that we do, um, just to get away from basketball and just be with each other all the time for 48 straight hours. So. I love it. And I know some coaches listening are trying to imagine going on 14, 15 hour trips with their team and they're, <laughs> they're giving you credit for that. Those are, those are great. Those are great bonding experiences though. And those are the things I think they remember more than, you know, anything really necessarily we coach or teach them <laughs> sometimes or those trips they get to go on. Right. And it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's not hard. It's not, it's not that much harder to do. You know, we all go to team camps and everything. It's just a little bit more food and a little bit longer of a drive. And that's pretty much the same thing.
and you get a beach. So, hey, we're going out there. <laughs> and yeah, you can't complain about that. Awesome. I mean, especially during the season when they're in the, the cold winters in Missouri. They'll remember yes. that. Oh, remember yeah. the beach? <laughs> I remember <laughs> those days. Awesome. Well, Coach Dressa, I want to thank you for talking a little bit about your program, talking about your uh, transition as you start to get out of your comfort zone and some of the new things that you're looking to implement. And, and I definitely think we'll uh, touch base in the future after the season's over and kind of see how it all went and some of the lessons that, that, that you learned from that. So hopefully it's a successful, safe, healthy season and, and best of luck, Coach. Uh, good luck going forward. Yeah, thanks again for having me. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. And thank you guys so much for listening. This was another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast, and we will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.